My name is Jonathan Rogers and along with my colleague Professor Ian Dennis I will be teaching the course in Criminal Process and Human Rights on the LLM at UCL in the season 2014-15. to This is a course which will run over two terms with ten seminars or two hours each in each term. I'm actually going to say a few more words at the end about the teaching format and assessment. What I really want to do is to tell you now what the course is all about. The course, as the title implies, is about criminal process and human rights. We are not just going to tell you about the law on criminal pro process in England and Wales for the sake of it. Indeed, there are some aspects of criminal process which we will not be discussing, such as bad character evidence, because it doesn't seem to us to entail any overlap with human rights law. What we are doing is focusing upon those aspects on criminal procedure which do have human rights dimensions, that still turns out to be almost all of them, and we'll be discussing to what extent our law complies with human right guarantees. Now this does mean that we are looking at the compatibility of English law with the European Convention on Human Rights, but when you consider the way in which we approach the course, you should see that it should be of interest to people who are from jurisdictions where they have constitutional rights instead of the European Convention on Human Rights. And it's certainly of interest no matter what jurisdiction you're from because the idea of the course is to decide what it means for a member state's law to be compatible with a very broad set of principles and rights. I'll give you some examples now. Article 6 on the European Convention on Human Rights guarantees by interpretation that every person convicted of an offence should be able to work out the basis on which he was convicted. That's a very simple broad right which is supposed to apply across Europe. How can it apply in England though given that juries give decisions in serious cases and juries simply say guilty or not guilty and are not asked, indeed are often not allowed, to give any further elaboration as to their reasons. It turns out, it seems, that English law is nonetheless compatible with Article 6 despite this problem and the way in which we argue this is to say that despite the jury not giving reasons in person there are other aspects about the procedure which effectively allow any convicted person to work out why he was convicted and the argument is that these safeguards are good enough instead. For example, every person charged with an offence will have the prosecution evidence given to him before the trial begins and the indictment laid at the beginning of the trial will make it very clear exactly on what basis the prosecution is alleging liability. Further, if the evidence is weak or cannot sustain a conviction, the judge will have an obligation to stop the trial on that charge before it even goes to the jury. There is also an appeal process at the end by which new evidence can be admitted and if the judge's directions to the jury weren't very clear about the basis upon which they might find liability then the appeal court might quash that conviction for that reason. The availability of all these points, disclosure, accurate indictment, ability of a judge to stop a trial and an effective appeal procedure can be said to mean that overall anyone convicted in a court of law can work out why he was convicted even though the jury doesn't actually tell it to him itself. And that's a good way of looking at what we're doing throughout the course. We're looking at what a substantive right of the European Convention might be and to what extent English law might be said in one way or another to comply with it. And the way in which we're looking at the course I think means that it's of interest to people who work with constitutional rights rather than human rights and it's certainly of interest no matter what jurisdiction you come from. Whichever jurisdiction you may intend to practice in or study you will have your own law of criminal process and the same techniques will be necessary in deciding whether your procedural rules comply with a broad constitutional or human right. I've just given you an example of a particularly English problem that is working with juries who don't have to give reasons for their decisions but others of you in other systems might have different problems. Uh, in continental systems for example 
it may take a very long time before a case comes to court. So the reasonable time guarantee may be more of a problem in those countries than it is in England. And again, you'll have to find your own ways of arguing that your own procedure is on the whole compatible with the fair trial reasonable time guarantee. I want to talk now about the content of each of the 20 seminars during the course, starting then with the first 10 in Term 1. In the first seminar, we're going to be discussing the basics of English criminal procedure, what the adversarial trial means, and the English criminal procedure rules, which have the overriding objective that the purpose of the system, including a purpose which every trial judge must have in mind and every appeal court judge must have in mind, is to convict the guilty and acquit the innocent. Now that may not sound very surprising, but it can mean that defence counsel has certain ethical duties not to obstruct the process, even if it may benefit his client. In the second seminar, we are going to be discussing the basic rights in the European Convention itself, the right to life under Article 2, the right not to be tortured or subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment in Article 3, right to liberty in Article 5, right to a fair trial in Article 6, that's the most important, and the right to privacy under Article 8. We will see how these broad guarantees can have particular application in various aspects of the criminal process and we'll also be discussing positive obligations, that is the duty of the state to protect actively our right to life and our right of liberty etc. In seminar 3 we will be discussing the balancing of rights. For example, when the police retain data about us, when they've arrested us or when they've cautioned us for an offence, the retention of this data does engage our right to privacy under Article 8. On the other hand, of course, you can see a certain public interest in them keeping certain amounts of information for future reference. So we have a balancing exercise to do. To what extent does the retention of information about us comply with Article 8? And that means to what extent is it necessary and proportionate for the police to keep all this information about us? And the way in which we try to balance rights against legitimate state objectives will be the focus of Seminar 3. From Seminar 4 onwards, we look at particular issues in the criminal process. We start in Seminar 4 with stop and search powers and police powers to keep the peace. Two important Strasbourg decisions immediately come into play. That is the case of Gillen, where the European Court struck down are very broad stop and search powers under the Terrorism Act of 2000 and the Strasbourg decision in Austin where they upheld kettling, that is the police tactic where they confine protesters in a certain area for fear that if allowed to disperse they may cause disorder elsewhere. In Austin the European Court decided kettling could be legitimate although when you read the text of Article 5, the right to liberty, it's not obvious how that decision can be reached. In Seminar 5, we are discussing police powers of arrest and the power to bail suspects pending trial. In Seminar 6, we are discussing the privilege against self-incrimination. That is the idea that nobody should be punished or disadvantaged for failing link to give information to the police or other investigators which might incriminate them in an offence. The leading case here is the Strasbourg case of O'Halloran and Francis, whereby the court held it was possible to punish motorists who didn't give information to the authorities when their car has been caught speeding or has been caught in an accident. In these cases, motorists can be punished literally for remaining silent. The European Court held this is compatible with Article 6. We'll be discussing that further and why this should be so. In Seminar 7 we will be discussing confessions and here the leading case comes from the Strasbourg case involving Germany, a case called Gafgen where a man was effectively tortured by the police into revealing where he had buried a boy's body and the question was whether that confession could be used against him. Clearly a case where the confession really was probative of guilt. In Seminar 8 
we will be discussing the use at trial of unlawfully obtained evidence. The leading case here again involves England, a case called Khan against United Kingdom. Here the police trespassed onto the home of someone suspected in drug dealing to plant a bug and by using that bug they were later able to overhear incriminating conversations. The European Court held that the trespass into the suspect's property violated Article 8, the right to privacy again, but this did not necessarily mean that the evidence had to be excluded from trial. So we'll be discussing further in this seminar when unlawfulness in obtaining evidence does mean that the evidence must necessarily be excluded from trial in order to give substance to the right in the first place. In seminar 9, we will be discussing prosecutorial discretion and the ability of police and prosecutors to go for lesser measures such as cautioning or conditional cautioning. In England, unlike some continental countries, there is no duty to prosecute. Once you have evidence that someone has committed an offence, you do have the discretion not to prosecute or to go for lesser measures. And a substantial body of case law has built up regarding how those decisions can fairly be made. In seminar 10, we are discussing abusive process. This refers to the ability of the judge to stop a trial in circumstances where to allow it would be to condone gross misconduct from the police or prosecuting authorities. The leading case here involves, again, the use of police bugs and drug dealers. In the case of Warren, the police nipped over to France to bug the car of a notorious drug dealer, knowing that French law did not allow them to use bugs and they deceived their French counterparts in assuring them that they weren't using bugs when that was exactly what they were doing. So the question was whether the court in Jersey was required to stop the case for abuse of process. A very narrow decision, the court decided it was not necessary to do so. Again, the question arises, does this mean that the right of privacy has proper substance or not?